chapter twenty eight of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty eight a slight and rapid sketch of mr allen o'donagough's successful schemes for increasing his acquaintance the heart of patty hardens itself towards jack the hubert family return to berkeley square and are visited by their relations more old friends we must not linger to watch every circumstance by which mr o'donagough was led or rather by which he led himself into precisely the position which he desired to fill in the motley mosaic of london society he kept his parisian model well in view and well too did he manage all the turnings and windings the sketchings and shadings necessary to the production of a perfect copy during the two years that general hubert's family remained abroad he and his lady between them had contrived to make a circle of acquaintance the most heterogeneous perhaps that ever met together in a london drawing-room which on the score of variety is saying a good deal for it more perhaps for the purpose of maintaining his influence over sir henry seymour by showing how easy it was for him to betray the foolish secret which the young man so pertinaciously desired to keep than for any particular wish for their society mr o'donagough had taken especial pains to make the acquaintance of sir edward and lady stephenson an ambitious project in which he was greatly assisted by the gentle lady stephenson's wish not to appear proud or repulsive to the near relations of her dear sister agnes the gay and wealthy frederick too and not a few more of an equally elevated station in society were frequently not displeased at finding card-tables and high stakes in a private drawing-room though he and they too might have felt considerable repugnance to having their names quoted as frequenters of gaming-clubs lord mucklebury and his free and easy son also not unfrequently amused themselves in the receiving rooms of curzon street while sir henry seymour seeing the statements of o'donagough respecting his family connection with the huberts and stephenson so fully proved fell completely into the snare that was laid for him and little as he liked his society became the frequent guest of the man whose feelings of friendly good-will were so extremely important to him happy indeed did he often think himself at being able at the risk of losing his money perhaps but with the certainty of enjoying an excellent rubber to escape from the affectionate friendship of mrs o'donagough and the still more oppressive coquetries of her daughter a multitude of others whose names are of no importance to the narrative were also gradually added to the o'donagough list of acquaintance till by degrees their soirees became actually crowded while the quiet master of the mansion kept his station with great constancy in the small third room with his faithful foxcroft ever hovering near him but his partie de jeu varying as occasion required the great game he was playing at this time without referring to any particular stakes whether at whist or piquet was too important to permit any considerations of minor economy to interfere with it his rooms were splendidly lighted strong coffee excellent liqueurs and abundant ices were freely distributed and though mrs o'donagough in the ecstasy of finding herself so immensely important a personage did sometimes exceed both in dress and demeanour the ordinary bounds of sober elegance yet on the whole she was by no means an inefficient partner in the concern she was indefatigable in her efforts to increase her circle of acquaintance and what with her handsome house showy carriage magnificent dress and universally recognized aunt-ship to mrs general hubert these efforts were more successful than those who knew mrs o'donagough best would have deemed possible her watchful husband therefore was on the whole exceedingly well contented and still continued to think that his barnaby was as well qualified to fill the splendid station in which her good fortune had placed her as any lady he knew not that he was blind to the species of gratification enjoyed in her society by lord mucklebury his son and some others of the same stamp but as he perceived that many of those who came to laugh remained to play he understood what he was about too well to quarrel with any of them in this manner and with a degree of success which soon removed from his own mind every fear lest his bold project should fail mr o'donagough went on with a steady quiet unruffled exterior of respectability which very effectually concealed all that it was necessary for his interest should be hidden few or rather none of those who were not professionally interested in the fact were aware how deep were the stakes nightly played for in mr o'donagough's drawing-room for if it happened that some rich but luckless novice became a victim the lamented adventure was always made to appear as something purely accidental as to its extent and merely the consequence of the temporary excitement of the parties which really was very foolish and must not happen again 
such was the prosperous state of the o'donagough affairs when the interval destined to montague hubert's itinerant studies between school and college being over the general and his family returned to england sharp was the sparkle of mrs o'donagough's still unextinguished eye when as she sipped her coffee and luxuriantly enjoyed the columns of the morning post she came upon the following paragraph arrived at their mansion in berkeley square lieutenant-general hubert his lady and suite that's delightful she exclaimed i declare to heaven that i shall have almost everything i want and wish in the world if i do but get agnes and the general here only just to witness one of our best nights and that crooked back little aunt betsy too it is not very likely that she should see it but she'll hear of it donny won't she don't you enjoy the idea of it to tell you the truth my dear i do not care one single straw about it replied mr o'donagough a year or two ago indeed when our circumstances were different that is i mean before we were quite settled i certainly thought that it was important for patty's sake particularly that we should be on good terms with these huberts but now it surely can make no difference whatever and her presentation at st james you know is all settled already you may cry down my relations as much as you please replied his highly incensed lady but you are monstrously mistaken and that i can tell you sir if you fancy that the name of hubert is of no importance to us often and often when i have said not a word about it i have seen its effect i know not how it may be in your back drawing-room set mr allen o'donagough but this i do know that half if not all the very best people in my front one have been got at by means of their knowing that agnes was my niece and as to going to court you may depend upon it i shall not go notwithstanding all lady susan dearwell's kindness without taking care to know that mrs general hubert will be at the same drawing-room of course elizabeth will be presented this year and it will be extremely advantageous that the cousin should be presented at the same time it will read so well in the papers and it is so easy to get it in you know you are a clever creature my barnaby and i am not going to deny it said her husband with a complacent smile i only meant to observe that we have gone on very well during the last two years well thank god we have i am sure i am ready enough to acknowledge that but still if you please donny we will not cut the huberts by no means my dear i have no such intention quite the contrary indeed i would rather you should leave cards there than not it will be more civil this condescending assurance was quite sincere mr allen o'donagough really had no objection to his lady's visiting general hubert's family nevertheless it was equally true that he did not care one single straw about it on first setting off on the bold and ambitious course he was now pursuing he had seized with a masterly hand upon every object that could help his progress but now feeling himself completely afloat he rather feared impediment than he hoped for assistance from a too near contact with those around him and though not insensible to the eligibility of patty's having such cousins and his lady such a niece he was not at all desirous of admitting general hubert to any very close degree of intimacy such being the prosperous state of her papa it can hardly be doubted that the state of miss patty was prosperous too and to a certain degree it certainly was so she was dressed as smartly as she could possibly desire had carte blanche as to the invitations she might wish to give her friend matilda drove in an open barouche with her mamma in the park every sunday and in all fashionable streets during every other day and finally was permitted to flirt as much as she liked with anybody and everybody all this was very delightful yet patty was not quite contented nevertheless by degrees she brought herself to acknowledge that jack was neither more nor less than a good-for-nothing false-hearted fellow who had never intended really and truly to marry her and who in his heart cared more for playing whist than for anything else in the world all this she acknowledged to matilda though to both mother and father she still persisted that she had been engaged to him quite entirely engaged to him but that she did not much care whether it came to anything or not of this statement her papa did not believe a single word though he never for a moment hinted his incredulity either to herself or any one else what mrs o'donagough's opinion on the subject might have been it was not so easy to say because on some occasions she did not scruple to declare as in the case of lord mucklebury that she believed the engagement was still going on though patty was such a coquettish young thing that she should not be at all surprised if she turned round and changed her mind any day 
while to others particularly to all young men of rank or fortune she stated confidentially that such an engagement had existed but it was clear to her that her dear girl began to doubt her own feelings on the subject in which case nothing on earth would ever induce her or her beloved mr o d to utter a word that might influence her for excellent as the connection was they were quite determined on this and every other occasion to let their only darling consult her own pure heart and nothing else in the midst of all this contradictory variety patty while endeavouring to look mysterious to both father and mother and saying little on the subject to either took to hating jack in her very heart of hearts most thoroughly and sincerely and she would have gone very considerable lengths as she confessed to her friend to plague him as he deserved a feeling in no degree less hostile had also very naturally supplied in the breast of the tender matilda the place of all other sentiments towards mr foxcroft and it is probable that nothing but their wholesome fear of mr o'donagough kept either fair one within the bounds of moderate rudeness whenever their faithless swains approached them nevertheless patty had her flirtations and miss matilda did her very best to have hers too so that there was not wanting between them a constant fund of confidential secrets which nourished and sustained their friendship in all its pristine warmth and purity having ascertained the affronting indifference of her husband respecting general and mrs hubert mrs o'donagough called him not again to her counsels respecting them but quietly settled in her own mind how to indulge herself by fully displaying to them and to all their daughters and sons the spectacle of her greatness amongst other simulations of fashionable manners adopted by the prosperous adventurer and his family was their ignorance and independence of each other's occupations and engagements before dinner mrs o'donagough was blessed by having at her command one of the most showy carriages in london arms embellished by a prodigious number of splendid quarterings adorned the panels the hammer-cloth hung stiff with embroidery of the same blinds of crimson silk aided the glowing complexions within and tags tassels and silver lace decorated those without let those who best know mrs o'donagough judge what her feelings were in driving to the door of mrs hubert in such an equipage as this with care and skill she chose that hour for her visit at which ladies are most certainly visible at home namely the interval between the two o'clock luncheon and the three o'clock sortie for shopping mrs o'donagough watched with some emotion the colloquy between the servants at the door but all her doubts and fears were speedily put to the rout by the throwing wide the door of her carriage and the presentation of the arm that was to assist in her descent from it you will sit in the carriage and wait for us my dears said the swelling lady with condescending dignity to the two miss perkinses who occupied the back of the carriage oh yes ma'am we shall be quite amused i'm sure returned miss matilda pray do not think of us meekly ejaculated her sister no 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 of course not my dear you will do very well i dare say take care about drawing up and down the windows what do you poke that beautifully laced pocket handkerchief into your bag for patty i did not buy it for that i promise you and that's true and no lie said patty winking at her friend as she prepared in her usual style to precipitate herself out of the carriage after her mamma but at the same time obeying the maternal behest and drawing forth the handkerchief with a flourish that sent it into the eyes of the simpering louisa there were several persons in mrs hubert's drawing-room when mrs and miss o'donagough were ushered into it at a small table apart near a window sat two very lovely girls each occupied before a little desk one copying a page of m s music and the other drawing behind the chair of the latter stood a tall and graceful young man whose head was bent forward as in the act of criticising the performance he started as the servant distinctly pronounced the words mrs and miss o'donagough but did not immediately look up on a sofa near a loo table at the upper end of the room sat mrs hubert and beside her an elegant-looking little woman apparently some few years older than herself but whose black eyes neatly cut little features and fine teeth still gave her a right to be called a pretty woman in a deep chair on the opposite side of the table another lady about the same age perhaps but infinitely less well-looking employed herself by incessantly twitching a green ribbon which being attached to the collar of a poodle lap-dog occasioned from time to time a sharp little bark that seemed to delight her mrs o'donagough had observed a carriage waiting at the door and the dress of these last-mentioned ladies showed that it was for them it waited and that they too were morning visitors 
if satin feathers and a profusion of the finest lace could have made mrs o'donagough look elegant she would have looked elegant then for she was dressed like a duchess nor was her daughter patty much less splendid and even had their names been unknown to all the party their appearance was altogether such as imperiously to have commanded attention but their names were not unknown to any individual present there it is possible that mrs hubert was not particularly delighted by this early visit from her remarkable aunt but most certainly she felt considerable consolation from perceiving that her manners though affectionately familiar were less vehemently caressing than formerly in fact mrs o'donagough felt and thanked god for the same that there was no longer any occasion for it besides it was impossible to press anybody to her heart now without risking the injury of her exquisite toilette so she only stretched out one arm as she advanced saying with a good deal of her most elegant lisp how do agnes dear what an age isn't it you would hardly know patty would you how are the children mrs hubert stepped forward and received the large offered hand very gracefully giving a smiling answer to each question patty followed after her and notwithstanding her anti hubert prejudices stretched out her hand too which was also received by mrs hubert with a smile while she turned her head towards the two young ladies at the window saying here is your cousin martha my dear elizabeth thus called upon a tall slight lovely girl rose from the place she occupied laid her pencil on her desk and came forward my goodness are you elizabeth exclaimed patty really too much engaged by staring at her to perceive her offered hand well i'm sure i should never have known you again i wonder if i'm as much altered as you i do not think you are at all altered replied elizabeth sitting down beside her but you are looking very well yes i am always very well and you know i have always got a fresh colour replied patty who was frequently apt to suspect when people told her she looked well that they might perhaps be thinking she had helped herself to a little of her mamma's rouge hardly anybody has got as much colour as i have i am sure i often wish i hadn't so much people stare so but my goodness is that emily oh no emily still looks quite like a little girl that is miss seymour as she said this the tall young man stood upright and stepping forward extended a hand to mrs o'donagough while at the same time he paid his compliments to her daughter by inquiring very civilly after her health so you are here are you sir henry how do you do said mrs o'donagough thrusting a hand towards the young man over her shoulder and throwing her plumed head on one side with a sort of lolloping affectation that was intended to indicate great intimacy i hope mr o'donagough is quite well ma'am said the young baronet with a considerable augmentation of colour quite well dear seymour replied the great lady i hope we shall see you to-night how late we kept it up tuesday didn't we but lord mucklebury is always so delightful while this was passing the lady seated on the sofa by mrs hubert looked and listened with great appearance of interest and amusement but said nothing at length agnes who had been watching her with a laughing countenance addressed mrs o'donagough you do not remember these ladies aunt and as she spoke she pointed to both her bonneted visitors remember them no really have i ever met them before i live in such a round of company that upon my honour it is perfectly impossible to remember one face from another you must excuse me ladies if i have the honour of your acquaintance but i have not the slightest recollection of you my name is henderson said the lady on the sofa but formerly it was mary peters mary peters ejaculated the energetic mrs o'donagough almost with a shriek mary peters my own dear first husband's own niece gracious heaven well to be sure this is a most extraordinary discovery and this turning to the plain-looking middle-aged mistress of the lap-dog this must be yes to be sure this must be elizabeth very true indeed i certainly am elizabeth replied the lady she addressed but i am sure i do not wonder at your not knowing me at first for i had not the least notion who you was i never saw anybody grown so large in my life you are so dreadfully thin yourself my dear that i have no doubt i do look rather large to you then turning her back in rather a marked manner to her former ally she addressed an almost interminable string of questions to her sister and so you are married mary are you well that's well i can't say i am any great friend to old maidism it spoils people's tempers 
i have had three god bless me i mean i have had two husbands both first-rate quite first-rate men in their way and i can't say i think i should have had the fine temper that i believe everybody allows i have got if i had remained single all my life however perhaps it is not quite civil to say so just now are neither of your sisters married my dear mary oh yes lucy has been married many years and has a very large family poor thing said mrs o'donagough with a deep sigh then i do pity her there certainly is nothing so pitiable as having a large family is it worse than being an old maid said miss elizabeth peters with a sneer no my dear replied mrs o'donagough turning sharply round upon her nothing of course can be so bad as that and how is your mother mary and your father and james i dare say he is married isn't he yes ma'am he is married also and what sort of style are you living in comfortable i hope we must not mind your being a little humdrum if you are comfortable but let that be as it may you must come and see me i think my drawing-rooms will please you but dear me how everything depends upon comparison i remember as well as if it was but yesterday thinking your drawing-rooms in rodney place quite beautiful but when you come to see mine my dear you won't expect me to think so any longer in fact my dear mr o'donagough has so very superior a taste that i must not talk of comparing what he orders to anything else i really want you to see my new carriage agnes it will strike you i think as something quite out of the common way mrs hubert smiled and bowed and looked at sir henry seymour and then at her lovely daughter as if to consult them both as to what her aunt was talking about being herself quite at a loss to decide whether she were in jest or earnest but she did not venture to speak for fear of making some blunder and mrs o'donagough increasing every moment in the delightful consciousness of causing unbounded astonishment began again and pray agnes dear who is that she said nodding her plumes in the direction of miss seymour it is not one of frederick stephenson's girls is it that young lady is miss seymour replied mrs hubert gravely a sister of yours my dear sir henry eh pray introduce her i shall be quite delighted caroline seymour who was several years younger than her brother and one of the most timid creatures that ever existed started up the moment these words were spoken and before her brother could perform the ceremony demanded of him was already though trembling and covered with blushes close to mrs o'donagough and extending her hand with an air that gave her the appearance of being eagerly impatient to make the acquaintance mrs hubert looked at her with astonishment while elizabeth hubert not too well knowing what she herself intended rose also and seizing the other hand of her young friend endeavoured to draw her away convinced that she was acting under some delusion and that she fancied mrs o'donagough had some claim upon her acquaintance which it was necessary she should acknowledge elizabeth hubert was partly right poor caroline knew that the terrible-looking woman before whom she stood and trembled had a claim upon her acquaintance which led her hated ever so much she would have acknowledged in church or market in court or city in public or in private clinging to her brother as her protector and only relative loving him beyond all things and knowing herself all childish as she was to be his only confidant and adviser in the unfortunate secret to the preservation of which he attached so much importance she would have knelt at the feet of mrs o'donagough rather than offend her for she knew but too well that this secret was in her keeping mrs o'donagough herself looked rather astonished and though in her present mood she would hardly have felt a salutation from royalty itself more than she had a right to expect she nevertheless had some consciousness that this peculiar eagerness to make her acquaintance must have a peculiar cause which however she was at no loss to find for after a moment's consideration she became persuaded that her shy but still enamoured brother must have enjoined it a very nice sweet-looking girl indeed sir henry said mrs o'donagough continuing to hold caroline's hand as in a vice and looking up in her face with a leer of playful protection you may bring her to us whenever you will sir henry patty who as you well know is the sweetest tempered creature in the world will be quite delighted to take notice of her and she will soon teach her not to be so terribly shy upon my honour the dear girl trembles like an aspen leaf you must not be afraid of us my dear your brother sir henry you know is a very old friend of ours he and patty you know are great cronies 
there come don't quiver and quake so as if you were talking to some proud stiff old empress ask your brother if we ever stand upon ceremony with him no no all that is nonsense my dear let my style and station be what they may i shall never hold myself above taking notice of warm-hearted affectionate young people who are fond of us and that i am quite sure you will be as well as your brother henry patty make room for this dear girl on that great three-cornered chair that you have put yourself into nothing like close quarters for making intimate acquaintance thus commanded patty did collect her flowing gros de naples a little and miss seymour placed her shrinking delicate figure beside that of the bouncing beauty but patty suddenly catching the expression of sir henry's countenance which certainly spoke anything but pleasure at the position of his sister remembered all her injuries at once and very decidedly shouldering the new friend her mother had bestowed on her exclaimed lor mamma i wonder you didn't tell her to sit in my lap caroline said sir henry in a voice neither clear nor sweet i beg that you will not inconvenience miss o'donagough place yourself here if you please and he pushed a chair towards her as he spoke the timid girl immediately took possession of it and considering that notwithstanding her mimosa-like shyness she had always been accounted peculiarly graceful in her demeanour she certainly looked more awkward and abashed than was at all intelligible mrs o'donagough laughed sir henry is right patty isn't he said she he wouldn't mind it himself perhaps but i suppose he thinks young ladies dresses may in degree whatever they do themselves it did look a little like what we call riding jolly font in my country two ladies upon one horse you know and the men never approve of that but come patty upon my honour and life we mustn't be staying any longer what will lady susan say if we don't keep our appointment with her good-bye agnes good-bye elizabeth be sure you come to see me mary what's your name henderson well i shall be very glad to see you of course when a woman marries again the relations of her first husband can't be quite so near and dear to her as a child by the second but notwithstanding that i'll promise to make you welcome and my old friend elizabeth here too though she does look a little as if she could not forgive my saying she was thin and quizzing her about being an old maid forget and forgive elizabeth you and i used to be monstrous thick you know and so we will again if you'll come and tell me lots of clifton gossip as you used to do good-bye you dear little seymour you she is the very picture of her brother and he is such a pet with us all good-bye sir henry don't come down there is nobody puts me into my carriage like my own footman with these words and a sort of circular nod she swam out of the room and patty with another nod rather less circular and infinitely less gracious bounced after her though not it may be observed without mrs hubert's allowing to herself that though as vulgar as ever the young lady had decidedly grown extremely handsome End of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty nine mystery considerably increased by explanation for a full minute and a half after the departure of mrs o'donagough and her daughter silence the most perfect reigned in the drawing-room of mrs hubert the palsy of astonishment had fallen upon them all with the exception of poor sir henry and their powers of articulation seemed destroyed by it mrs henderson was the first who recovered herself sufficiently to speak why did you not tell me agnes into what full-blown dignity your aunt was expanded full well do i remember the sort of terror and trembling with which my mother used to contemplate her feathers and flounces at clifton but though the feathers and flounces remain much the same the change in their august wear is prodigious i do not mean solely from her having spread out into such startling immensity you had in some degree prepared me for that but why did you conceal the increase of wealth and dignity which seems to have fallen upon her my weak mind is perfectly overpowered not more than mine dear mary replied mrs hubert laughing i do not comprehend it the least in the world she surprised us as i told you by suddenly descending upon us at brighton when we all fancied she was safely lodged for life in australia 
but though very showily dressed and perpetually assuring us that her husband was a man of family and fortune and a most perfect gentleman we never had any reason to believe that these statements were more strictly correct respecting mr o'donagough's position in life than respecting himself he is by no means an ill-behaved person looking more like a methodist parson than anything else but no more like a gentleman than elizabeth poodle and as to their manner of living it was very nearly what you may remember my aunts to have been at clifton the carriage and horses and the footmen are all quite new have you known them long sir henry seymour said mrs henderson turning to the young baronet yes no no not very long certainly he replied while his whole face became crimson at any rate you seem to be treated as a most intimate friend observed mrs hubert looking at him with astonishment and perhaps you may be able to tell better than any of us though we are all such near relations how long mrs o'donagough has lived in a fine house in curzon street and possessed a carriage and footman to talk about she certainly meets me with much familiarity replied the young man dropping his eyes but at the same time permitting his countenance to express no inconsiderable degree of hauteur yet believe me i have no right to boast of knowing much about her i have never known her in london but in this same house in curzon street and as far as i know she has always had a carriage well then all we can say dear mary is that our aunt is a richer lady than we imagined said mrs hubert oh she always told us she was very rich you know said miss peters and i remember the time when she told my poor father that she intended to leave all her money to us because it came from our uncle barnaby nay elizabeth it cannot be barnaby money that supports this gay london establishment i remember your good uncle's manner of living perfectly my good uncle let me call him too for it is impossible that anything could be more kind and liberal than he was to me but his fortune could never i am very sure support the style of living that we have been hearing of to-day is it possible then that the man she brought to our house just before you married agnes and with whom she immediately sailed for australia could have been really a man of family and fortune as she says i remember the man perfectly he was a great many years younger than herself and it is hardly conceivable that he should have married such a woman excepting for the sake of her fortune and he was a very handsome man too i remember him perfectly as well as you mary observed elizabeth peters and i always supposed that he must have married aunt barnaby because he had no fortune of his own mr o'donagough has lost his beauty since that time elizabeth as i think you will allow when you see him and i confess i do not perceive any remains of it i have not indeed the slightest recollection as to what he was like when he made his visit in rodney place but at present he is anything but well looking said mrs hubert i suppose a call upon my uncle barnaby's widow is a duty imperative upon us said mrs henderson i think my mother herself would say so though she was not very particularly partial to the lady personally i think you must go there dear friend returned agnes and in your case this offering to propriety is easily paid you do not live in london and may therefore consider yourselves safe from any great or lasting annoyance this early visit to us would i confess rather alarm me for our peace and quiet were it not that i perceive we are no longer of the same importance to her as formerly her manner to me is entirely changed i as well as you mary escape without even an embrace and i assure you that the time has been since her return from australia when she has held me so long in her arms that i almost felt doubtful if i should escape from them alive my dear father too thank heaven she seems altogether to have forgotten him he is in very delicate health and her vehement caresses and unceasing attentions fatigued him dreadfully besides dear man he always seemed to think that it would be treating my mother's memory with disrespect if he were otherwise than affectionate to her sister i have perfectly dreaded his returning to england lest he should be again thrown in her way but she never named him and it is evident to me that she has got into a set of her own that she prefers to every other i shall return her call without the slightest feeling of alarm and we can go together if you like it it is probable that mrs hubert prolonged this discussion a little in order to give her young friend caroline seymour time to recover from the very evident embarrassment which the recent scene had occasioned her her brother was still hanging over her chair and whispering something that seemed like a gentle remonstrance elizabeth hubert sat gazing at them with a sort of painful surprise on her beautiful and expressive countenance which did not escape her mother who in her heart was longing even for her dearly loved mrs henderson to go that she might speak to her 
at length the visit of her old friends who were in london only for a few weeks was brought to a conclusion by miss peters reminding her sister of the necessity for their driving to some distant shop before they returned home to the early dinner which was to precede their going to the play sir henry seymour had taken his leave before and caroline on whose soft cheek the traces of tears were visible when she raised her head to bid him adieu followed him out of the room and had not since returned so that mrs hubert and her daughter were tete a tete what can be the reason mamma of sir henry seymour's permitting his sister to make the acquaintance of mrs o'donagough said elizabeth the moment their visitors were gone it is it must be his doing and his wish caroline never has any will but his yet it was impossible not to see her repugnance to this introduction though she put herself forward in a way she never did before to meet it what can it mean i am quite as much at a loss as you are elizabeth did caroline ever mention to you her brother's acquaintance with the o'donagoughs yes mamma but what she said was not so much informing me of his acquaintance with them as inquiring of me whether they were really our relations and when was this elizabeth during the fortnight that sir henry passed with us at paris last year when he brought over caroline can you remember exactly what she said she must have given some reason for asking the question i recollect thinking that she felt very much ashamed at asking the question and that was the reason i never mentioned it to you she asked it very earnestly and as if she were much interested in the answer but when i had replied to all her questions which i did of course very frankly she coloured so much and seemed as i thought to be so extremely ashamed of her curiosity that i fancied it would be treacherous and like betraying her having committed a fault if i repeated the conversation to you has she ever referred to the conversation since never will you tell me elizabeth exactly what it was she did ask of you elizabeth meditated for a moment and then replied i remember perfectly that the question appeared to me at the time to be apropos of nothing and it was asked a very few hours after their arrival as soon indeed as we were alone together as well as i can recollect her words were will you tell me dear elizabeth if you have any relations of the name of o'donagough i answered yes we have mamma has an aunt who is married to a person of that name have they ever been in australia and have they a daughter demanded caroline i answered yes to both these questions and then ventured to inquire why she was so anxious to know it was then that she seemed to think she was doing wrong for she coloured violently and actually trembled exactly as she did to-day it was my brother she said it was on his account that i wished to know i wished excessively to ask for what reason he would be curious about it but i did not because i saw that she was positively suffering so from that time to this the name of o'donagough has never been mentioned by either of us sir henry must have met them accidentally said mrs hubert when they probably did us the honour to mention the relationship which perhaps he did us the honour of disbelieving and feeling some curiosity to ascertain the truth commissioned his sister to inquire yes exactly so mamma that is precisely the way in which i interpreted the thing myself and it was because i thought the curiosity both natural and pardonable that i chose to say nothing about it but it strikes me that though your suggestion accounts perfectly for what passed at paris it throws no light whatever on the extraordinary scene of to-day it was very natural that sir henry seymour if acquainted with the o'donagough family might doubt their relationship to you mamma but the having ascertained that such was the fact could not surely render it necessary for caroline to testify such extraordinary eagerness for an introduction and such very vehement emotion when it took place i saw sir henry's countenance too and its expression was perfectly extraordinary he may have been very much surprised and shocked too perhaps at discovering that mrs o'donagough was our aunt though that is presuming him to be a very silly person indeed but even that will not account no not in the least degree for the species of emotion which his features betrayed i am quite sure there is some mystery in all this mamma i cannot conceive the possibility of any replied mrs hubert the notion of sir henry seymour and the family of o'donagough having any mystery in common is too preposterous time generally explains all things and we must trust to his agency elizabeth to explain this the few moments occupied by this conversation was a longer period of time than mrs hubert and her daughter had passed together tete-a-tete since their arrival in berkeley square and another burst of thunder at the door now told them that it was over another and another succeeded as the time for the high tide of gossip approached and the drawing-room looked almost full when again the thunder came and lord mucklebury was announced 
this facetious nobleman though not a very intimate was a very old acquaintance of the hubert family and seeing that close access to mrs hubert was for the time impossible as every seat near her was occupied he deposited his heavy person in a large fauteuil just behind elizabeth and after expressing in cordial but courtly phrase his admiration and astonishment at her growth and her beauty he began uttering and discussing jokes and gossip in his usual style concerning everybody whom he conceived to be of her acquaintance so sir edward and his rich ward have settled accounts i hear and are the best friends in the world again they say that sir edward's management has been admirable and that there never was known so profitable a minority it is a strange match that he is going to make i beg your pardon however my dear young lady i totally forgot the near relationship what match my lord said elizabeth striving to speak tranquilly and of what relationship does your lordship speak mrs o'donagough is your mother's aunt my dear is she not she is my lord replied the poor girl with lips as white as ashes and a voice so hoarse as to be hardly intelligible lord mucklebury perceived that she was suffering from some painful emotion and a moment's thought convinced him that he had made a most unfortunate hit and that this collateral descendant of his proud old friend lady elizabeth norris was wounded beyond bearing by being reminded of her vulgar connections amused by this strong trait of hereditary feeling yet much too really polite to be capable of exciting it further his lordship rejoined in a tone of flourishing compliment distant as the connection is miss hubert there is some share of the same remarkable beauty that i now see before me sir henry seymour would never have become attached to miss o'donagough if the young lady's eyes had not sparkled with something of kindred brightness to your own another group of morning visitors entered at this moment and among them elizabeth fancied she saw some one to whom she wished immediately to pay her compliments it appeared however that upon drawing near the door she discovered that she was mistaken for standing aside while the party passed in she waited only till the doorway was clear then slipped through it and was not again visible that morning mrs hubert had remarked her daughter's exit she remarked also that she did not return and wishing to inquire if it were any ailment which occasioned this sudden retreat she entered the dressing-room of elizabeth before she proceeded to make her dinner toilette in her own is anything the matter with you my love she said approaching the easy-chair into which the young lady had thrown herself why did you leave the drawing-room so suddenly you look as if you had been crying elizabeth no mamma there is nothing at all the matter with me only i have been surprised very much surprised but the mystery is quite explained i have found out mamma the reason why caroline was so anxious to be introduced to the o'donagoughs and why she seems so extremely interested about them have you elizabeth replied her mother drawing a chair and sitting down beside her do pray communicate the discovery to me for i confess the whole thing has piqued my curiosity exceedingly sir henry seymour is going to be married to my cousin martha sir henry seymour going to be married to your cousin martha that is a very foolish jest my dear whoever invented it replied her mother with rather a disdainful smile lord mucklebury did not speak of it as any jest mamma but as a fact perfectly well known i am surprised as much as you can be continued elizabeth but i see no reason for doubting its truth on the contrary have we not the greatest reason for believing that it is true how else can we account mamma for the strange scene of this morning i should account for it in any way elizabeth rather than this and there was a glow of painful feeling on mrs hubert's cheek as she said these words which caused elizabeth to move still nearer to her and to say as she took her hand and tenderly pressed it my dearest mother is there any other possible way in which we can account for it mrs hubert did not immediately reply there were many thoughts working together in her head which kept her silent the young man of whom they spoke was a favourite with her though the vexation and anxiety which he had caused to his guardian were well known to her in every particular for lady stephenson and herself were truly sisters but notwithstanding all this notwithstanding the lamentation she had been accustomed to hear concerning his aversion to a college life and his very blamable frolic of secreting himself for nearly a year from the knowledge of his attached though somewhat pertinacious guardian notwithstanding all this mrs hubert both liked and esteemed the youth his tender devotion to his young orphan sister his repentance for the wrong-headed obstinacy of his concealment expressed with such manly frankness his joyous yet gentle spirit 
and the bright intelligence which sparkled through every lively sally had won from her approval that she was aware was rapidly approaching to affection and the more rapidly because her husband shared it neither of them perhaps were insensible to the evident admiration with which elizabeth had inspired him and though as yet the subject had never been named between them neither of them felt indifferent about it or unaware that it was hardly possible any man could propose for her that they should be more cordially inclined to approve all this was too fully in mrs hubert's head to make it at all easy for her to reply to her daughter's question elizabeth's timid eye watched her mother's countenance during this interval and at length she repeated is it possible mamma to account for it otherwise thus forced to speak she said forgive me elizabeth but i must have better authority than yours before i believe it lord mucklebury is a professed jester he probably meant to mystify you or it is possible that amidst his flights and flourishes you have misunderstood him so i shall not set down sir henry seymour as the fiance of miss o'donagough till i have learnt it from some other quarter than the facetious lord mucklebury so saying mrs hubert rose and having received a very fervent kiss from her silent daughter left her room and immediately repaired to that of miss seymour the poor girl had thrown herself upon the bed and as it seemed had actually cried herself to sleep she started up as mrs hubert approached the bed and uttering something about being quite ashamed of her laziness stood up to hear what her kind friend was coming to say to her my dear caroline said mrs hubert will you let me ask you how your brother first became acquainted with the o'donagough family an expression of the most painful kind took possession of the young girl's features and after the struggle of a moment her tears began to flow i cannot bear to distress you my dear child said mrs hubert nor can i comprehend how my question can do it you are of course aware that mrs o'donagough is a relation of mine but both her husband and herself are persons so little likely to fall in your brother's way that i feel curious to know the origin of their acquaintance instead of replying miss seymour only permitted her tears to flow afresh and hid her face in her pocket-handkerchief my dear caroline this emotion is most extraordinary if the idea of this acquaintance is so painful to you why did you appear so eager my dear to be included in it for my brother's sake mrs hubert for his sake only surely you must guess that i should never seek the acquaintance for my own were the words which would have followed had not the young lady recollecting that mrs o'donagough was the aunt of her kind hostess suddenly stopped herself amidst blushes and renewed agitation mrs hubert waited for a moment to see if she would go on but finding she did not she dropped the hand she had taken and sang with a sigh which she could not repress yes my poor caroline i do guess left the room End of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty old times are changed old manners gone honour and glory maternal wisdom and filial reverence as mrs o'donagough descended the stairs from mrs hubert's drawing-room she suddenly recollected the existence of her beloved brother mr willoughby and with a little inward laugh of delight at remembering how very much she was now above caring for the kindness and patronage of any little old man in the world she stopped short in her passage through the hall though it was ringing with the sound of mrs o'donagough's carriage and demanded of the porter the address of this till now very precious connection on being informed that mr willoughby resided in park lane she determined to take him as she told patty and the mrs perkins in her way to hyde park where she intended to regale the world of fashion for half an hour by the sight of herself and her bright-eyed daughter could the gentle mr willoughby have had the slightest glimpse of foreknowledge as to who was making her rattling dashing way towards him it is probable that despite all his conjugal respect for the memory of his first lady he would have retired to his bedroom and declared himself very truly perhaps too ill to see any one for the impression left by his adventures at brighton was terrible and of the kind not likely to evaporate by the process of meditation but though in all the ordinary affairs of life it may be very truly said that old experience doth attain to something like prophetic strain yet in this case it would have led him altogether wrong 
a change had come over mrs o'donagough which insured his safety more effectually than any bolts and bars could have done for had her feelings still retained the same ardent warmth towards him such impediments would hardly have rendered him safe but now the tempest of her love was effectually stilled and all that remained of the violent emotions which had so strongly moved her was a dignified yet condescending politeness which her dress also being taken into consideration was sure to keep him from any further personal violence fortunately the mild old gentleman was not alone and when his drawing-room door was gently opened by his well-taught servant and the names of mrs and miss o'donagough pronounced his daughter mrs stephenson was seated beside his armchair, and as he involuntarily exclaimed oh dear oh dear she cheered him by replying never mind papa i'll stay with you i want to see her again immensely i am told she has come into a great fortune and that she is ten thousand times a greater curiosity than ever these words were hardly whispered before the subject of them swam into the room radiant with rouge and glossy as the richest satin could make her had she found mr willoughby alone it is very likely she might have been able to speak plain and that a few moderately affectionate inquiries would have sufficed to satisfy her feelings and to display as much of her changed circumstances as the occasion required but the sight of mrs stephenson inspired her with very different thoughts and purposes she remembered how the noble spirit on which she prided herself had been shaken by the crowd in green and gold and more bitterly still did she remember how often the application of the little lady's eye-glass had stood in the stead of every other salutation when she had met her amidst the crowded promenades of brighton how her heart at that moment throbbed with thankfulness as she remembered that the lace on her mantlet cost a guinea a yard but her throat swelled externally and internally too a third chin supervened and the clearness of her articulation was considerably affected patty followed looking past all contradiction exceedingly handsome but as much like a gentle woman as a ringleted head in a hairdresser's shop window how do dear sir said mrs o'donagough lispingly and holding out a single finger as she approached the idolized brother-in-law of former days i know you are but a poor creature as to health and therefore i have waived all ceremony and come to inquire for you without taking any notice of your not having waited upon me never mind about getting up perhaps you have got the gout there there sit down and keep yourself quiet you look dreadfully thin to be sure but yet i may pay you a compliment upon your complexion if you ain't flushed you've got a capital colour but perhaps you may be heated sir dear me what a monstrous small room you have got when you are well enough to come and see me sir in curzon street i think you will quite enjoy the size of my rooms inexpressibly relieved mr willoughby replied with great kindness of manner that he was very glad she had met with a house she liked and hoped mr o'donagough and the young lady were quite well you do not remember me mrs o'donagough said mrs stephenson laughing we have never met since we left brighton and the gaieties of london have put all your former acquaintances out of your head i hope i see you very well yes perfectly well i thank you i adore london and never really enjoyed my health till we settled here replied mrs o'donagough it does in truth seem to have agreed with you extremely you look charmingly plump and well and so does your daughter too she is so wonderfully grown and improved that i should not have known her without hearing her named have you seen your cousin compton lately miss patty no ma'am said miss patty very sulkily indeed that is too bad of him rejoined the mischievous lady for he is in the guards now and constantly in town is he said mrs o'donagough in a tone of rather languid indifference i wonder i have never heard seymour mention him but henry knows she added with a slight laugh that i never patronize mere boys who is henry are you speaking of sir henry seymour said mrs stephenson half amused and half puzzled yes sir henry seymour your brother sir edward's ward you know he is a great friend of ours she added after a pause and with her eyes very fully directed to patty impossible had very nearly escaped mrs stephenson's lips in return for she understood the look and the accent too exactly as it was intended she should do and having ideas of her own on the subject of sir henry seymour which rendered the information they conveyed extremely far from agreeable she had some difficulty not to pronounce a flat contradiction 
but having thought better of it before the word was spoken she only said have you known him long oh yes was the reply but these two little words were spoken in a very skilful manner and said much had mrs stephenson been rather less warm-hearted and warm-headed she might have given sir henry seymour the advantage of a little more consideration of probabilities than she did upon hearing this oh yes but she looked at the great brilliant staring beauty opposite to her and remembering the pale unobtrusive loveliness of elizabeth permitted herself to tingle to the fingers ends with indignation while she received the impression that the man whom she had fixed upon in her heart for her nephew was adoring the meretricious goddess instead of the genuine angel if not reasonable enough to acquit him however she soon recovered sufficient discretion to conceal what she felt and consoled herself with the belief that she should still be in time to give such a caution to her sister agnes as might check the present intimate intercourse between the young people before it had gone far enough to compromise the happiness of her dearly beloved and greatly admired niece notwithstanding mrs stephenson's quickly awakened caution the well-contented mrs o'donagough saw that she had made an impression and skilfully passed on to other themes not having any wish or intention of fixing the imputation which he had suggested at all more deeply than might suffice to plague the faithless sir henry a little and add a feather to her daughter's coronet of conquest without committing herself by any positive assertions i suppose you don't plague yourself about going to court now mr willoughby it's a dreadful bore isn't it but that's one of the troubles which having a daughter to bring out occasions said mrs o'donagough with a sigh then turning abruptly to mrs stephenson she added when is elizabeth hubert to be presented it is probable that this question preceded as it was by the hint of mrs o'donagough's own intentions might not have received a very direct answer had it not been that the fair lady to whom it was addressed was entirely lost in reverie and quite unconscious of everything that had been said since mrs o'donagough's insidious oh yes had entered her ears without any hesitation therefore she replied with a slight start from the suddenness of the address at the next drawing-room well patty we must not indulge to-day in a long gossip with your good uncle we must be off dear or positively we shall not get through what we have to do lady susan always keeps me such an age adieu brother willoughby come and see us there's a good man it will do you a vast deal of good depend upon it changing the air is always good for an invalid and most certainly you can hardly have a greater change than from this little bit of a room to our suite of drawing-rooms in curzon street good morning mrs stephenson of course i shall be vastly happy to see you if you choose to call ceremony between such very near connections is quite ridiculous good morning mrs stephenson was lost in astonishment mr willoughby in delight at the prodigious change which unknown circumstances had wrought in the style and manners of mrs o'donagough what in the world does all this mean papa exclaimed the still pretty nora as soon as the door was closed upon her she has ceased to hug you does not appear to retain the slightest awe of me and both herself and her brobdignag beauty are dressed à peindre that is to say their dresses are perfect but unfortunately for such folks there is no madame anything who has taken out a patent for disclosing the secret of putting them on thank heaven that is a power still exclusively reserved à nous autres and not all the reform bills in the world can take it from us dearest nora that is all very true i believe said her father rousing himself from the agitation occasioned by the sudden apparition of mrs o'donagough and profusely steeping his handkerchief in eau de cologne but what are the peculiarities of dress compared to those of manner i do assure you my dear that i have the very greatest desire to be kind and cordial to all with whom i became connected by my first marriage i have very particular reasons for wishing it but this good mrs o'donagough's manner used to be blank however there is no occasion to say anything more about that now i am very thankful nora very thankful indeed that it is quite changed i really hope my dear from their dress and appearance altogether that some considerable fortune has come to them it must be on the husband's side for i am pretty sure there was no chance of such a thing on hers mrs elizabeth compton certainly is a woman of good fortune but i think i have understood oh yes papa mrs elizabeth compton's fortune is disposed of elsewhere none of the satins and laces come from her 
i am really dying with curiosity to find out what it all means by your leave cher papa i will ring the bell i must positively make a few inquiries be so good as to send my page upstairs was the order given when a servant answered the bell ah ça achille vous avez des yeux mon enfant dites-moi un peu quelle sorte d'équipage était-il qui vient de partir superbe madame et les gens les chevaux superbe madame tout était superbe parfaitement bien monté c'est bon va-t'en now is not this most extraordinary papa do you remember mrs o'donagough's style of trotting about brighton oh you must for how often did she make you trot with her and you hear what her present style is is it not mysterious no my dear not if mr o'donagough has got a fortune left him that is true certainly and yet in all cases of that kind one is pretty sure to hear of the fortune first and see the effect of it afterwards that makes no great difference nora they could not spend all this money if they had not got it and i am certain nobody can feel more inclined to rejoice at their good fortune than i do did you observe what she said about sir henry seymour papa not very much nora i was really selfish enough to be thinking of myself and of the great comfort of her being more quiet in her manners replied the gentle mr willoughby i shall visit her papa i am quite determined upon it do my dear it will be very good-natured of you perhaps not quite that said mrs stephenson laughing nevertheless my motive is not a bad one either i cannot comprehend the thing at all seymour of all the men in the world i must throw some light upon all this papa and i know not any mode of doing this so effectual as introducing my own radiant presence into the scene of action if there be a mystery nora replied her father i certainly can name no better investigator than yourself but i suspect you will find none my good sister-in-law has by some means or other grown rich and this somehow or other has rendered her less affectionate or at any rate less demonstrative i do not think i should mind asking her to dinner now if you and agnes will arrange it all for me very well papa nous verrons and now good-bye i have a thousand things to think about and to do so had mrs o'donagough on re-entering her carriage she seated herself with an energy of descent that severely tried the temper of the springs and set the two miss perkinses swinging i have got that much out of her at any rate patty haven't i my dear said she dismissing her extra chin and recovering her voice about miss elizabeth's going to court mamma yes i did want to get at that and now we have it safe and sure replied patty joyously i must say i shall enjoy going the same day that she does she is such a quiz of a girl and oh so proud and stiff matilda i am sure she would make you both sick if you could see her she is ten times worse than she was at brighton the lord forbid patty for see her they shall you may depend upon that upon my life girls she has no more colour than my pocket-handkerchief and though i won't pretend to say that her features are bad i give you my honour that she's no more to be compared to patty than chalk to cheese but here we are girls out with ye all this is the court dressmakers and now you shall see if i don't make donny's shiners gallop he told me to spare nothing in our court dresses and i don't intend it dear lady susan what should we do without her i promised i would send her a plume exactly the same as my own and that shall be one of the handsomest that ever was seen at st james she deserves a dear kind soul for if she had not offered to present us i should have had to ask some of my own nasty stiff-backed relations and after all you know there is not one of them that is the daughter of an earl she shall have her feathers dear old soul she may depend upon it and her table too every night if she likes it with her own stakes and her own party this grateful effusion was confidentially uttered in the ear of miss louisa perkins now promoted to the regular but by no means sinecure place of mrs o'donagough's toady as they walked together up the stairs which led to madame bonneton's splendid show-rooms oh what a sight did you ever exclaimed patty as she entered this fairyland of woman's wishes and of woman's dreams embodied and tangible dear me how beautiful cried miss louisa oh goodness how lovely sighed miss matilda 
can you fancy any woman looking quite ugly in that angelic bonnet demanded patty let me see madame bonneton herself commanded mrs o'donagough these last words were not spoken in a tone to be neglected not to mention that the elegant young lady who replied to them had seen the splendid equipage from which the speaker descended madame will be here immediately said the elegant young lady she is at this moment engaged with the duchess of liddesdale respecting her only daughter the beautiful lady isabella's presentation dress but she must have nearly finished for they have been here a long time isn't it lucky louisa whispered mrs o'donagough now we shall be able to find out exactly the right thing one beautiful only daughter going to be presented especially as she seems to be of suitable rank may safely serve as a pattern for another let us sit here louisa while we wait isn't it all lovely lovely indeed responded miss louisa to be sure i do sometimes think said mrs o'donagough with a fullness of satisfaction which for the moment banished all reserve and made her almost think aloud i do sometimes think louisa that great abilities thorough real cleverness i mean is a better fortune for a girl that is supposing she is tolerably well looking than almost any money in the world you know i open my heart to you about everything and therefore i don't mind telling you that my father and mother notwithstanding their high birth and great gentility had no more right to expect that i should ever be in such a place as this ordering court dresses for myself and my daughter than you have to be queen of england oh dear how well i remember going shopping in our little town where my father was the rector it was a very fine living and a magnificent parsonage house but i do so well remember my contrivances to get handsome ball dresses for myself and my sister sophy <laughs> i can't contrive to make you exactly understand all about it but to be sure i have managed from that time to this to get on monstrous well a movement in an inner room and then the stately march of three ladies out of it followed by madame bonneton announced that the consultation was broken up and in another minute the elegant young lady having whispered something in the ear of the imperial-looking mistress of the establishment mrs o'donagough's highest state of felicity began by seeing that august personage approach her and hearing the enticing words what may i have the honour of showing you ma'am i wish to see whatever you have of the very best and highest style by way of court dress presentation dresses that is i mean for my daughter of course i do not mean that i have never been presented that would be a good joke louisa wouldn't it but nevertheless i wish that my own dress should be superb and that of my daughter something nearly equal to it by the way what did the duchess of liddesdale order for lady isabella this was said in mrs o'donagough's best manner and if overheard by her husband would unquestionably have won from him the cordial exclamation of well done my barnaby its effect on madame bonneton was just what she intended you know her grace madam we meet at every party throughout the season but i won't tell you that we are great friends which i dare say you saw as she passed but the fact is my daughter has stood in the way of lady isabella more than once and the foolish duchess cannot forgive it i don't care a straw for that however it only piques me to keep up the rivalship i often say that the duchess's jealousy of my daughter will make the fortune of my dressmakers what has been ordered you must positively tell me madame bonneton what has been ordered to-day for lady isabella madame bonneton was almost as clever a woman as mrs barnaby and immediately gave such a description of the noble young lady's dress as enabled her to dispose of various articles for which she was rather particularly anxious to obtain a sale and the business ended by a dress being ordered for miss patty and for her mamma likewise both of which were ingeniously contrived in such a manner as to accommodate more embroidery more flowers more fringe more tassels more spangles and more lace than any two dresses ever carried before into a royal presence it would be too difficult to describe justly the swelling joy the broadly smiling contentment the swimming ecstasy of mrs o'donagough as she made her last congé to madame bonneton for any wise pen to attempt it she hardly felt the ground beneath her feet as she descended to her carriage though had the ground beneath her feet been sentient the unconsciousness could not have been reciprocal for not only did the high consciousness of what she had been about dilate her majestic person to the eye but it gave a firmness to her tread which might have rivalled the sublime march of an elephant let this plume of feathers follow me to my carriage she said 
i mean it as a present to a friend and will leave it as i go home remember that every direction i have given be accurately followed the slightest inaccuracy will be remarked and as expense is no object let every article be perfect absolutely perfect in its kind the two miss perkinses intimate as they were with mrs o'donagough had never seen her at anything like this degree of elevation before there was a sort of sublime excitement in all her looks and words that almost made them tremble and which added to the orders they had heard her give made them follow her downstairs with feelings of veneration almost too profound to be pleasant even patty herself was perhaps a little astonished but she had too much inherited firmness of spirit to be overwhelmed by it isn't mamma a first-rate thorough-goer she said to her friend matilda while waiting for mrs o'donagough's not very easy introduction of herself into her carriage how she has wriggled papa out of his stingy ways to be sure between the dwelling of mrs bonneton which was in st james street to that of lady susan deerwell which was situated in green street grosvenor square mrs o'donagough never uttered a word it is probable that her feelings were too big for utterance when the servant's inquiry for her ladyship was answered by the single word yes mrs o'donagough broke this expressive silence by earnestly ejaculating thank god and having as usual on all visiting occasions told the dear perkinses to sit still and amuse themselves till she came back she proceeded followed by patty and the plume up the narrow staircase to the dirty little drawing-room of her noble friend lady susan was sitting as was her wont in an old-fashioned shabby-looking armchair which like all the rest of her furniture had more of that sort of antiquity about it which results from long and constant use than from the well-preserved or well-imitated stateliness of the renaissance her ladyship's cap was of exceedingly dirty blonde and her ladyship's gown of exceedingly long worn satin a cat in better case than anything else in the apartment was seated in a chair opposite to her while on a perch close by it all natural hostility between the parties appearing to be extinguished screamed a magnificent cockatoo the note of welcome uttered by this amiable creature rendered all other greetings for some time inaudible but at length it betook itself to silently nodding its head and then her ladyship was heard to say never mind never mind the bird there sit down sit down both of you but don't disturb the cat take that chair my girl that one out there i can't have my cat disturbed how are you my dearest lady susan said mrs o'donagough in an accent of deferential affection is that abominable rheumatism that tormented you so last night more quiet to-day i don't know i am sure anything about it just now for i've been busy i've been making out my card account for the last month but i tell you what mrs o'donagough the tea you gave me last night was most abominable so weak i mean you must recollect if you please that if i come to your house to play cards i do it out of pure kindness of course to give a good style to your rooms you know but then i must have tea that will keep me awake remember i positively will not play without it to be sure not my dearest lady susan good heaven of course i am so very much obliged to you for naming it it's so like you such kindness so very friendly i am sure i can never thank you enough this series of exclamations acted much as her ladyship's own hand did upon the back of her ladyship's own cat which jealous it may be of the near and passing approach of the visitor was come to look after her own interest and now sat in the venerable spinster's lap in short mrs o'donagough's gentle touches so far rubbed down the temper of the old lady that she said with rather unusual civility well and what do you come for now give me that box patty said mrs o'donagough without making any direct reply here my dearest lady susan is the real object of my coming may i flatter myself that these feathers suit your taste they are well enough for feathers replied the noble but very sour-looking maiden but it is quite nonsense and out of the question if you suppose i can stick them on by way of a head-dress to go to court that may do all very well for a young girl like your blousy miss there with a cart-load of curls on her head but you know well enough it won't do for me i must have a cap to wear with them if they are to be of any use of course my dearest lady susan i never dreamt of anything else but as i observed to patty as we drove along to madame bonneton's it would not do at all for me to take the liberty of buying your ladyship a cap 
till your ladyship had been kind enough to tell me what sort of one your ladyship would like why for that matter there's no such great variety mrs o'donagough the only question is between brussels point and blonde and i like the brussels point best and brussels point it shall be my dearest lady susan and now about the day you know the next drawing-room is fixed madame bonneton tells me for the twenty-ninth i hope that will suit your ladyship suit humph i can't very well say it suits me mrs o'donagough for the plain truth is i have got no suit at all it's years and years since i last went to court and i thought you knew that i should never have dreamed of going now with no earthly motive but just to present you and your daughter i should never have dreamed of going if you had not promised that i should have no trouble at all about it and what's more i won't neither really i have no notion of it it is quite too bad my dearest lady susan began the frightened mrs o'donagough you have only to say exactly what you want and wish and madame bonneton shall send it in without your having the least trouble in the world will your ladyship have the great kindness to give me a little list of everything you would like to have and i will see to it without giving your ladyship the least atom of trouble in the world there is no need of a list mrs o'donagough replied the old lady taking a long pinch of snuff i only want a proper dress to go to court in the train must be black velvet and the petticoat satin i don't care two pence about the colour only don't forget the gloves and shoes you know i will forget nothing dearest lady susan you will go with us then on the twenty-ninth yes if all my things are sent in properly without my having any trouble about it i will good morning then dearest lady susan i will take care that everything shall be right good morning take the plume back with you for mercy's sake i can't think how you could be so thoughtless how do you suppose my old alice would like to have the plague of fastening it in to be sure what a fool i am so very thoughtless take the box again patty good morning dearest lady susan good-bye there that will do i hate shaking hands take care that i get some good tea this evening mrs o'donagough don't go and forget that depend upon it dearest lady susan depend upon it and with these words mrs o'donagough at length tore herself from her most valued friend to be sure nothing ever was more kind and flattering than dear lady susan dearwell's behaviour to patty and me people may call it illiberal or affected if they will but i do like the nobility and it is no good to deny it said mrs o'donagough as soon as she was reseated in her carriage and she then added i hope you won't be tired with a little more driving you too i mean louisa and matilda for you will have to get home to brompton you know but i really must go down to madame bonneton's again her obsequious friends of course assured her that the greatest pleasure they could have was to go about with her on again reaching the portico of this votary thronged temple of fashion mrs o'donagough in her usual unceremonious manner of settling all things in which the dear good perkinses were concerned proclaimed that she did not wish them again to enter it with her and taking patty with the footman and the box mounted to the shrine before which the priestesses were still performing their respective offices the most exact and satisfactory orders were then given respecting the court dress of lady susan Deerwell with a hint in conclusion that her ladyship did not wish her ladyship's bill to be sent in to her ladyship till christmas at which season her ladyship always settled all her ladyship's accounts good gracious mamma whispered patty as they descended the stairs how frightened the old woman will be when the bill is sent in i thought you were going to make her a present of it all and i am sure she thought so too i dare say she did my dear replied mrs o'donagough and i had my suspicions that you might fall into the same mistake and it was just for that reason that i made you come up and left the perkinses in the carriage because i hope it will be a useful lesson to you patty when people have a great object in view my dear and your papa says our going to court is a very great object they should always make use of every means in their power to bring it about but when it is done patty they of course owe it to themselves to take care that the sacrifices they have made to obtain it should become as little injurious to them as possible 
this is the principle upon which i have just acted and you may depend upon it my dear child that without firm and steadfast principles of action no one will ever get honourably and prosperously through life that's all very well mamma replied patty but i'll bet you five pounds the old lady will never speak to you again after she finds out the trick you have played her well my dear returned her mother with great dignity and composure and what difference will it make to me whether she does or no i choose to have a person of title to introduce me at st james to obtain this i submit to endure considerable annoyance and to suffer many inconveniences good i ought to do this i should be unwise if i did not but the object once obtained should i be wise to submit still to these annoyances no patty what was wise before would be folly after and render me totally unworthy of the confidence your father reposes in me remember all this my dear girl and always act as much as possible in conformity to my example at this moment mrs o'donagough's carriage which had been obliged to make way for another recovered its place before the door and the mother and daughter entered it the happier and the better for the delay for the young lady felt that she had listened to what might be very useful to her one day or other while the elder one enjoyed the most delightful satisfaction that can warm a parent's heart namely the consciousness of having established an excellent principle in the breast of a child End of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty one preparation the happiness and prosperity of mrs o'donagough approach their climax dressing for court a scene at st james two of the most exciting events that her greatly varied life had given rise to were at this time rapidly approaching mrs o'donagough the first was being presented together with her young daughter at the court of her sovereign the other the giving her first ball at home after a very long deliberation it was decided that both these momentous events should take place on one and the same day there were some reasons against this arrangement but there were more for it and moreover of the latter number were the two overpowering facts first that with the exception of the train the whole court dress might be worn by both ladies at the ball and secondly that having assembled together everybody they knew no other opportunity would be so favourable for making the important circumstance of their presentation generally known this point once settled the whole body and soul of mrs o'donagough were offered up with a sort of desperate intensity to the business of preparation far different indeed and triumphantly did she remember the difference were her preparations now from what they had been the last time she anticipated the pleasure of seeing her own relations as she ever described both families of stephenson's as well as general hubert's perhaps the only point of resemblance was that the dear good perkinses were aiding and assisting at both and here there certainly was no change for at brighton they had devoted themselves wholly and solely to do mrs o'donagough's will and pleasure and so they did now miss matilda indeed was no longer the same animated creature she was then for she had ever since the unhappy affair of mr foxcroft entirely changed her style of dress and her tone of manners instead of pale pink ribbons and variegated wreaths of roses and geraniums she now confined herself wholly to white muslin and the dark but gracious decoration of la fleur des veuves her style of conversation and indeed her whole deportment had undergone a change equally remarkable she sighed a great deal and very seldom laughed and though it is possible that in her tete-a-tete -tete intercourse with her ever faithful patty some traces of her former gay disposition might recur she had decidedly assumed to the eyes of all others that most interesting character a disappointed young lady her first meeting with mr foxcroft had been a little awkward but the gentleman ayant pris sa partie exhibited so little consciousness that anything particular had ever passed between them that at length the two miss perkinses made up their minds not to care a farthing about it either and had it not been that miss matilda had a little prematurely communicated to most of her friends and acquaintance the probability of her soon changing her name the white dress and la fleur des veuves might have been altogether omitted perhaps however it was better that things should be as they were the white gowns and la fleur des veuves produced together a sort of transition state from which it was much easier for miss matilda to emerge again into the bright light of love and hope 
than it would have been had their picturesque and gentle sadness never been assumed mrs o'donagough's ball appeared extremely likely to restore the fair mourner to rainbow tints and frolic smiles if anything could and in fact after a few days of doubtful gladness during which she had listened almost in silence to patty's joyous anticipations of this day of days her spirit yielded itself to the delicious impulse of reviving hope and upon her young friends exclaiming we'll waltz till five in the morning matilda see if we won't the mists of disappointed tenderness dispersed like a cloud before the sun and phoenix-like she rose from the ashes of the flame which had so nearly consumed her when the master of a house says i wish you to invite everybody you know and that no expense be spared to make the thing go off well the thing let it be ball rout fete champetre or what not is pretty sure even in the hands of an ordinary female to be a very dashing affair what then was it likely to become in those of mrs o'donagough time presses and paper wanes or whole pages might be filled in a very useful and interesting manner by describing all the superb devices to which that high-spirited and tasteful lady had recourse in order to make her ball outshine all other balls mr o'donagough witnessed all this but breathed not a single restraining syllable indeed it was quite evident that his object was to make a great display and though his mind was a good deal occupied by affairs of a private nature he from time to time found leisure to exclaim in the most encouraging tone well done my barnaby on two points only did he offer any observation that could be construed into interference the first was concerning the third drawing-room which he informed her must be kept altogether sacred to the four or five card-tables which by great ingenuity it was made to accommodate the second was concerning the champagne i will take care he said that it shall all be of proper quality but you must remember that a few dozens which i shall set apart and mark with a cross are kept exclusively for the card-room and you must remember likewise my barnaby that richardson the waiter you know that i have hired occasionally for that room must not be called away for anything else i will give him his orders as to the manner in which he is to wait upon us and now my dear i shall trouble you with no further instructions attend to these and i will venture to predict that everything will go well and perfectly to my satisfaction i have already told you that the longer the dancing is kept up the better and with patty's charming spirits and yours my dear there will be no difficulty about that none at all donny dear never you fear about that replied his thrice happy wife and as for the other things you may depend upon it i will do my best about richardson and the wine and all that of course there will be no difficulty because you will give him your own orders and he's a fellow that understands at half a word but about keeping this third room sacred as you call it i am afraid that won't be quite so easy for you know donny that when the other rooms are full people will be running in here for air and for the comfort of the sofas in that beautiful recess and i am sure i do not know how i shall prevent them never mind then my dear i'll manage all that myself i won't have any candles lighted up in the recess as there generally are and then as it is such an out-of-the-way corner nobody will be likely to get to it i know however as well as you do that the room is sure to be full particularly at the beginning of the evening but that will be of no great consequence if you will take care to collect all the loiterers when you go down to supper if we get too busy to relish further interruption it will be easy enough to shut the doors while you are at supper and lock them too if it was necessary of course if any observation was made you would just mention that the gentlemen are at supper mr o'donagough knew his admirable wife too well to think that after this short colloquy there would be any occasion to say more from that time his happy barnaby had the delight of proceeding with her preparations unchecked and uninterrupted by a single observation from him some speculative people may perhaps suspect that among mrs o'donagough's widely spread invitations some might fail of their effect and that she would have to sustain many disappointments but all such are completely mistaken the reasons which all the world with wonderfully few exceptions find for accepting an invitation to a ball known to be given on a large and handsome scale are more various than all the world is itself aware of whereas the effective objections to it if the virtue of the fair inviter has never been impugned and a few people of fashion are known to be expected are few indeed as to mrs o'donagough though by no means of a doubting or timid temper she herself hardly dared to anticipate the success which attended her 
for some excellent good reason or other almost everybody she had ventured to invite chose to come and what with friends and friends friends her list of acceptances far exceeded her hopes so actively and admirably had this highly gifted lady managed her affairs that when the morning of the twenty ninth arrived she found herself perfectly at leisure to indulge in a most luxuriantly long toilette in preparation for her appearance at st james the woman who as all well-informed persons know even at the very outset of her career had so well understood what the habits of people of fashion required as to provide herself with a betty jacks was not likely in this full-blown and prosperous period of her existence to want a lady's maid perfectly accomplished in her profession mrs o'donagough was happy enough to have attached such a one to her service and by half-past eleven o'clock the two dear good miss perkinses and mrs bumford the abigail stood beside the bed the sofa and the chairs of mrs o'donagough's apartment very nearly in act to worship the gorgeous paraphernalia thereupon displayed fortunately the bedroom of patty was close beside or rather close behind that of her mamma and thus the adoration the sweet commotion and in a word the whole operation of dressing went on together in the two rooms as if they had been but one to any person who loved the study of natural history it would have been pleasing to see how prettily the generic features of the mother and her offspring displayed themselves there was precisely the same movement of the different muscles as the different causes of activity presented themselves the nerves and indeed each distinctive faculty seemed moved by the self-same spring and one might almost have persuaded oneself that the existences of mother and child were one so perfect was the union in partition which they exhibited by degrees however the absorbing interests of each separate mirror compelled them to cease the delicious intercourse between room and room with which the business had opened miss louisa became fixed where she could gaze at and applaud mrs o'donagough miss matilda became fixed where she could gaze at and applaud patty while the almost omnipresent bumford glided from room to room with rapture on her lips and pins between her teeth till one by one every costly article of the multitudinous toilette was adjusted now ma'am said the lady's maid i do think that everything is quite perfect and to be sure i never did in all my experience see any ladies look so glorious in court dresses as you and miss patty isn't it true ladies she continued turning to the two faithful miss perkinses who had never permitted an eye to wander during the whole process isn't it true did you ever see anything so noble as my mistress what a presence i shall wonder if the queen and all the lords and ladies don't pay particular attention to her how the plume sits ma'am don't it and then the spread of the petticoat showing off so beautiful the embroidery and the bunches of flowers i would not live with a lady as didn't go to court if they would double my wages i wish bumford you would just see if you can't tighten my body the least bit in the world i look rather larger than i ought to don't i matilda about the small of the waist oh patty you are perfect exclaimed her enthusiastic friend with hands clasped and shoulders elevated as others use who sport with the plastic feelings of young ladies under similar circumstances very well then returned patty quietly and for the moment at least perfectly satisfied very well then bumford perhaps you had better let well alone of course i don't want to be pinched any more if i can help it i know that i can hardly draw my breath as it is nonsense patty exclaimed mrs o'donagough indignantly for mercy's sake don't speak so like a vulgar housemaid how do other ladies draw their breath i should like to know don't you talk mamma i am sure it is quite impossible you can be tight laced such an enormous size as you are oh my dear patty how can you say such a word cried miss perkins there is something so noble in your mamma's look that i am sure it will be all the pities in the world to alter it lord bless me louisa you need not fly out so responded patty who told you that i wanted to alter anything you had much better mind your own business and not try to set mamma against me hold your tongue patty said mrs o'donagough too happy to be angry at anything you never looked so well in your life i should like nothing better than just to see miss elizabeth hubert stand side by side with you to-day she is no more to be compared to patty than the sun to the moon is she the good humour of patty thus judiciously restored the four ladies descended to the drawing-room 
where the thoughtful mrs o'donagough had ordered biscuit and wine to be placed to beguile the few last moments before the clock announced that they might set out for the dwelling of lady susan like all other ladies who know what they are about mrs o'donagough and her daughter had been refreshed by a basin of soup during the progress of their dressing nevertheless they both felt thankful as mrs o'donagough expressed it for a good glass of wine and a good or at any rate a full glass of wine she took and another after it as she remembered how overpowering it must be to find oneself face to face with the queen and then as she stood with the open decanter in her liberal hand urging the spinster sisters to take another glass she once more replenished her own for the sake of saying with becoming unction well patty here is good luck to us the few last moments of all were given to admiration of the drawing-rooms prepared as they were for the festivities of the evening and then the mother drawing herself up before one pier glass and the daughter before the other they awaited with beating hearts and radiant eyes the arrival of their equipage here it comes mercy on me i almost wish it was over just shake out my train once more bumford come along patty take care of yourselves girls i am glad we settled that you should stay all day and dress here for i know i shall be dying when i come back to tell you all about it now then and in another minute the mother and daughter placed opposite to each other that each might gaze upon each were on their way to lady susan Deerwell's. the old lady made herself to be waited for so long that mrs o'donagough's wrath outblazed her rouge and together with her three glasses of wine caused a redness of the nose that by no means tended to tranquillize the florid tone of her general appearance at length the tall pale figure of lady susan perfectly well dressed but having discarded whatever needless decoration madame boniton had bestowed upon her entered the carriage offering so remarkable a contrast to the two figures already in possession of it that each of the three became aware of it their silent observations ran thus what a quaker-like object thought mrs o'donagough it is well patty and i have some style about us or the whole party would be passed over as horrid humdrums oh the hideous old stick thought miss patty but she is no bad contrast though to such a girl as me mercy on me how shall i ever stand this thought the noble spinster i have the greatest mind in the world not to go now but happily for the debutantes her ladyship recollected that if she did not go she should not only have to pay for her own dress but be obliged to give up the high play in which her soul delighted or at least to abandon one of the most commodious scenes for it that she had ever enjoyed so she looked at her two companions and smiled without uttering a single word of salutation good bad or indifferent good morning dearest lady susan said mrs o'donagough perfectly sure that her ladyship's silence proceeded from envy and mortification at the splendid appearance of herself and her daughter i hope we have not hurried you i wish we had settled to go an hour earlier replied the old lady perusing the figures of her two companions from top to toe however i flatter myself the crowd will be very great this was literally thinking aloud and might have puzzled any one who had listened to it but that mrs o'donagough did not having caught sight of some passing plumes almost as umbrageous as her own and becoming from that moment too intent upon peeping into every carriage past or passing to have any distinct consciousness of what was said in her own the crowd at st james was as great as her ladyship could possibly desire and it was not without difficulty that the three ladies made their way upstairs and into the presence chamber by the time they had achieved this the senses of mrs o'donagough were so completely bewildered that she knew not what was said to her which way to turn or what to do on reaching the top of the stairs her first movement was to seize upon the arm of lady susan but this did not answer for the wily old lady felt that if she submitted to this the crowd in which she was glorying would have availed her nothing and therefore without the slightest ceremony she shook off the weighty arm which had seized her and saying take hold of your daughter's arm mrs o'donagough and walk on she managed to glide forward alone and perform the duty she had undertaken with as little identification of herself with her protégés as it was well possible to imagine but if lady susan Deerwell had reason to rejoice in the crowd mrs o'donagough and her daughter had still more for so completely had they both lost all idea of what they ought to do and where they ought to go that but for the impulse from behind and the occasional repetition of that useful warning go on go on it is probable that they would have performed some very extraordinary evolutions indeed 
as it was however they reached the royal lady in safety but so much before they expected it that mrs o'donagough started with such violence as nearly to extinguish the eyes of the unfortunate individual against whom she retreated having however recovered her equilibrium and her consciousness she began to feel the most violent desire to pause and look about her a little and nothing short of the gentle violence applied to her huge elbow could have induced her to pass on finding that no choice was left her she perforce followed the line that was moving off and having by a magnificent tossing round of her lofty head ascertained that patty followed soon reached a point where she found herself at liberty to breathe look about her and make herself as conspicuous as possible now it was that she found the pleasure which she had promised herself not altogether imaginary till this delightful moment she had been really hurried on in a manner which had made her almost forget her own magnificence her daughter's beauty and the delight of exhibiting both in such a presence but now she awakened again to a delicious consciousness of it all and every inch of her seemed to become instinct with lofty thoughts and dignified delight where is lady susan my dear she demanded of her staring daughter in a tone considerably more sonorous than was usually heard from the spot where she stood i can see her nowhere we must stay here my love and wait for her the blooming patty nothing loath drew up by the side of her mamma and the two ladies stood together in the most conspicuous place they could contrive to occupy talking in whispers of all around them and bringing into action such a variety of nods and becks and wreathed smiles as speedily made them the object to which every eye within reach was directed not long after they had taken possession of this station a group approached from the presence chamber which for a moment at least drew all eyes from mrs o'donagough's geranium velvet train and flower and fringe bedecked white satin petticoat nay even from patty's pink and silver her tassels and her trumpery her rouge and her ringlets to fix themselves on the very daintiest vision that ever seemed to come direct from paradise to grace the circle of a mortal's court this was a young lady from whose beauteous eyes seventeen summers had scarce sufficed to banish the shy bright gazelle-like glance of childhood there was a look of innocent and delicate timidity in her sweet face that had need been would have called around her a bodyguard of all the preux chevaliers within reach and yet there was so much of easy grace in every movement of her tall slight person that one dared not apply the epithet of shy to her though one might to her eyes lest it should do her the vile wrong of suggesting an idea of awkwardness her dress train and all was of white satin the corsage being decorated only with pearls and resembling in form to that most historique of fashions in which van dyck delighted to paint his fair and noble ladies a narrow bandeau of pearls sufficed to secure the feathers that gracefully drooped over her dark and luxuriant hair which was parted without ringlets and gathered into a rich grecian knot behind had this beautiful girl been surrounded by none but graces and nymphs she would have shone among them all like a planet among the lesser stars and might have challenged not only the court of st james but that of windsor too with all its beauties dead as well as living without any danger of meeting a rival but there was something singularly striking in the contrast offered by her peculiarly refined appearance and that of poor patty who chanced at the moment of her appearance to be in possession of all eyes excepting indeed those which were fixed by preference on her mamma there was a smile on more faces than one as she advanced among those who loved to mark whimsical contrarieties but this smile changed to a look of unmixed astonishment when mrs o'donagough was seen to stretch forth her enormous arm and seize upon the hand of the delicate creature who was winning her way onward through the yielding crowd every one of necessity left the presence chamber in single file and it was only when thus seized upon that elizabeth hubert for she it was who was thus unluckily encountered turned round her head to look for her mother mrs hubert was close behind and despite the equable composure of mind which she usually displayed she now coloured deeply and stepped forward to take the arm of her young daughter with a sort of maternal instinct not altogether unlike what a dainty doe might have felt on seeing her pretty fawn run down by a huge elephant well my dear agnes if this isn't luck exclaimed mrs o'donagough releasing the daughter while she made a step in advance to clutch the mother i am monstrous glad to see you for we have absolutely lost lady susan but i don't mind it at all now that we have met you for we can all go on together and then the cousins can look at each other a little you know that's what girls love but what made you dress her so very plain my dear i suppose you think it suits her everything depends upon style certainly 
patty looks well don't she while this was uttered the imprisoned mrs hubert walked onwards without raising her eyes from the ground and her friends must forgive her if for once in her life the quiet unpretending self-possession of her character gave way before the nervous agitation produced by this encounter yet in the midst of it she felt glad rather than sorry that general hubert was not with them and though really frightened by the loud tone of her aunt's terrible laugh which she well knew must be bringing all eyes upon them she struggled to sustain such an appearance of composure under the infliction as should prevent her from herself becoming a part of the comedy they looked upon but there was one who notwithstanding all her efforts to look tranquil saw that she was suffering and thereupon with more zeal than discretion perhaps pressed forward to rescue her and her blushing daughter from their painful companionship let sir henry inquire for the carriage mamma said elizabeth on seeing him approach and quite forgetting all she had been meditating upon for the last three weeks without speaking a word to either party sir henry seymour wedged himself rather unceremoniously between mrs hubert and her daughter silently offering an arm to each which was as silently accepted but mrs o'donagough was not to be so dismissed keeping fast hold of agnes notwithstanding the difficulties offered by the presence of the crowd to an arrangement which placed four persons in a row she put her other arm behind her and pulling patty who was following closely at her heels into a situation favourable to the manoeuvre she contrived by a sudden jerk to withdraw mrs hubert's arm from that of sir henry saying at the same time give your other arm to patty there's a good fellow i'll take care of my niece if you'll look to the girls sir henry for a moment the young man forgot his secret and all the fears connected with it pray take my arm mrs hubert he said without noticing the request of mrs o'donagough or appearing either to see or feel patty whose plumes were in his face but this imprudence was bitterly repented when his indignant fellow-voyager pronounced the monosyllable jack in an accent which he perfectly understood though nobody else did the effect was magical mrs hubert's arm was instantly resigned and his elbow presented to patty instead will you take my arm miss o'donagough he said in a tone so quiet and subdued that elizabeth who had no notion that the word mrs o'donagough ejaculated had any reference to him instantly fancied that tenderness towards patty occasioned this softened tone and that although he might probably not have wished to distinguish his fiancee by any public attention he could not resist the temptation thus thrown in his way this confirmation of lord mucklebury's intelligence caused her to shudder from head to foot a very natural consequence of which was that she withdrew her arm from that of the tortured young man and making a sudden movement forward urged her way through the crowd alone i beg your pardon mrs o'donagough said agnes forcibly withdrawing her imprisoned arm but i must beg you to let me follow elizabeth oh by all means my dear of course i shall see you to-night these last words uttered very nearly in mrs o'donagough's loudest key were at least satisfactorily heard by those around though if heard they were unheeded by her to whom they were addressed for too well did mrs hubert comprehend the feeling which had caused her daughter to drop the arm of sir henry and too anxious was she to be with her to leave any faculties at leisure wherewith to listen to her terrible aunt as agnes retreated mrs o'donagough passed behind patty and sir henry and possessing herself sans ceremonie of the arm which poor elizabeth had quitted marched him forward in a position as completely contrasted to that which he had held a few minutes before as it is possible to imagine mrs hubert and elizabeth being upon his arms in the first case and mrs o'donagough and patty in the second having thus by force of arms compelled the unfortunate sir henry seymour to remain exposed in this conspicuous condition to the eyes of half his acquaintance for a longer space than any party ever lingered in the same purlieus before mrs o'donagough at length prepared to descend the stairs and having reached the door of exit called aloud in her own strong voice for mrs o'donagough's carriage and servants while from time to time she requested the still firmly held sir henry to call for them also but though these calls were ably seconded by the officials around they were all in vain no servants no carriage could be found for the first five or perhaps ten minutes mrs o'donagough was not displeased with the bustle and the fuss thus occasioned because she was herself the cause of it but by degrees as the fact became more and more evident that there really was no carriage at all in waiting for her she ceased to swell from dignity though nature appeared to be carrying on the same operation within her through the agency of rage 
as equipage after equipage drew up for others while she remained waiting in this desolate condition the irritation of her feelings caused her repeatedly to run forth almost under the horse's heels in order to ascertain by ocular demonstration whether it were indeed possible that a lady possessing a carriage of her own with horses coachman and footman to boot could possibly be thus abandoned these repeated sorties had for the company present servants included the twofold advantage of displaying in the broad light of day her own magnificent figure to the gaze of all and of rendering sir henry's tete-a-tete with her daughter almost as remarkable as she could herself have desired the poor young man was certainly at his wit's end and perhaps a little further for he really felt distracted by the manifold misfortunes which had that morning fallen upon him and which were not a little aggravated by seeing sir edward stephenson pass by during one of mrs o'donagough's little out-of-door excursions and stare at him and patty as they stood tete-a-tete and arm-in-arm together in a corner with a degree of astonishment that seemed to deprive him of the power of speaking for he passed on without addressing him at length however after every carriage and every soul belonging to them had been driven away the long-lost equipage made its appearance and when mrs o'donagough's vociferous indignation permitted the voices of her servants to be heard she learned that they had been employed in the service of lady susan deerwell who had appeared at the door summoned them to attend her and ordered them to take her home to green street well that is so like my poor dear lady susan cried mrs o'donagough still trembling with rage how will i scold her for it get in patty shall i set you down anywhere sir henry no i thank you ma'am replied the irritated young man with what seemed to be his last possible effort at concealment of the feelings which had tortured him and then slightly touching his hat he made way for the servant to close the carriage door and was out of sight in a moment ain't i glad she will have her dress to pay for exclaimed mrs o'donagough to patty as the carriage drove off and ain't i glad we plagued that conceited sir jack as we did responded her lively daughter End of chapter thirty one